Good morning and welcome to First Baptist Church of Sterlington. My name is Cody Keys. I'm the associate pastor here. Thank you for joining us today online. If you are a guest with us today, uh, if you would take a moment and you would click the connect card link in the comment section of this video, we would love just to connect with you this week and just give you some encouragement and thank you for joining us. Also, if you call First Baptist Church your home and you aren't able to make it uh, to our physical location today um, and you would like to give, then that giving link is also in the comments section below. So thank you for joining us today and worshiping with us. Uh, we're continuing our sermon series uh, called Who's Your One? And, and as we walk through that, if you're watching today and uh, and you have not started a personal relationship with Jesus, I'm just here to tell you this morning that our God is in the business of saving lives. So he is here for you if you will just give your life to him today. Uh, but if you are a believer and you're uh, watching, um, then sing this along, this truth uh, together as the body this morning. Let's sing. In the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Spirit, Lord, we come. We're gathered together to lift up your name, to call on our Savior, to fall on your grace. Hear the joyful sound of our offering As your saints bow down, as your people sing We will rise with you lifted on your wings And the world will see that Our God saves Our God saves There is Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Spirit, Lord, we come. We're gathered together to lift up your name, to call on our Savior, fall on your grace. Hear the joyful sound of our offering as your saints bow down, as your people sing. We will rise with you lifted on your wings And the world will see that Yes, the world will see that Our God saves Our God saves There is hope joyful sound of our offering as your saints bow down as your people sing we will rise with you lifted on your wings and the world will see that yes the world will see that our God saves our God There is hope in your name. Morning time, songs of praise. 
continue to sing today let's uh, turn our voices to him see I count on one thing I count on one thing I'm the same God that never fails will not fail me now you won't fail me now in the waiting same God who's never late is working all things out. You're working all things out. Oh, yes, I will lift you high in the lowest valley. Yes, I will bless your name. Oh, yes, I will sing for joy. When my heart is heavy in all my days, oh yes I will. See that first verse again. I count on one thing. And I count on one thing. The same God that never fails will not fail me now. Don't fail me now and in the waiting. The same God who's never late is working all things out. You're working all things out. Oh, yes, I will lift you high in the lowest valley. Yes, I will bless your name. When my heart is heavy in all my days Oh yes I will all my days Oh yes I will And I choose to praise To glorify, glorify the name of all names And nothing can stand against And I choose to praise Glorify the name of all names. Nothing can stand against, and I choose to praise. To glorify, glorify the name of all names. Nothing can stand against, and I choose to praise. To glorify, glorify the name of all names. When my heart is heavy in all my days Oh yes I will all my days Oh yes I will all my days Oh yes I will Hey, I want to uh, just say welcome today. Thanks for joining us uh, for our online worship service today. And uh, for whatever reason that you're at home, we want you to know that we love you, we miss you, and hope to, uh, to see you again real soon in person. And with that being said, if, uh, if, if things work out and you are feeling up to it, on uh, November the 8th, we're bringing in a man by the name of Wade Morris to, to preach to our church, to do a youth event uh, that night. And uh, man, it's going to be a great day in the life of our church, a great opportunity for you. Maybe there's someone that you've been uh, praying for, someone you've been trying to find a way to introduce to our church, but more specifically, 
trying to find a way to have a gospel conversation with. Hey, on November the 8th, when Wade is here, going to be a great chance for you to bring that person at 9 o'clock or 11 that morning and uh, to have them attend church with you. We've still got plenty of room. We're spaced out in two services. And so uh, we're doing our best to, uh, to stay safe, but also want to do the most with the time that God has given us. And so... As we're in this Who's Your One focus, uh, I want to encourage you to do your best to try to be here at 9 a.m. or 11 on November the 8th. But uh, thanks again for joining us today uh, as we are in this Who's Your One uh, kind of focus sermon series. Uh, remember, one person, one conversation could lead to one life changed forever. And so as we begin today, take out your Bibles, your app there, and turn to Acts chapter 3. Uh, we're going to look at verses 11 through 20 today and kind of pick back up on the story of Peter and John and the things that were happening with them. Uh, this week I was thinking about a board game, or not really a board game, a game called Speak Out. And uh, you know that game where you take the mouthpiece and you put it in and, and you, try to, uh, you try to say whatever phrase is on the card, but because you can't move your lips, uh, it ends up coming out really jumbled. And um, a lot of people play the game not to win, but just to laugh. Uh, folks get so caught up in laughing at one another that, that you really can't understand and you really can't know what's going on. And, and usually you just get tired of playing and you put it up. Uh, but very few people actually can kind of complete the game or play it to win. Maybe you're like me and you're one of those folks like, no, no, if I'm playing the game, I'm playing to win. But, but really with Speak Out, it's all about trying to figure out what somebody is saying. And as we're in this focus and as we're in this Who's Your One series, I couldn't help but think this week that sometimes for us, uh, we can miss the point of, of what we're saying or we, can't, or we can struggle with how to say something or, or trying to get it out specifically when it comes to sharing the gospel. We feel like there's a mouthpiece holding our lips back and it just won't come out clear. But when it comes to sharing our faith, we have to find ways and we have to be sure that what we're saying is clear. And so I, I want to pick back up in Acts chapter 3. Remember last week, Peter and John had gone to the temple at the hour of prayer. They healed uh, a crippled man there, a man who had not been able to walk and move around from birth. And they heal him in the name of Jesus. And, uh, and then he is restored to health. He's able to go into the temple with them. And we're going to pick the story up right there as the people in Acts chapter 3 have, are now noticing this man who used to lay outside is now running and leaping and praising God. And it's drawing together this incredible crowd for Peter and John. So look with me at Acts chapter 3 starting in verse 11. It says, While he, that being the crippled man, clung to Peter and John, all the people, utterly astounded, ran together to them in the portico called Solomon's. And when Peter saw it, he addressed the people, men of Israel, why do you wonder at this? Or why do you stare at us as though by our own power or piety, we have made him walk? And so let me just stop right there and let's kind of walk through this as it unfolds. Uh, the crippled man and Peter and John obviously have gone in. The people have seen this. They've drawn together into a large crowd. And when Peter sees the crowd, Peter begins to address them. And he immediately begins to take their attention off of himself and off of John and to focus it in a new direction. And so as you and I think about our message and what we need to do, here's the first thing I want you and I to remember today. Is that our opportunities, those opportunities we talked about last week, our opportunities are given so that we might declare our message. Peter knew that this healing of this man was not the point. Although it was a good thing and it was something that was needed, it wasn't all that God was doing. He wasn't just healing the physical. There was more going on. And so Peter immediately, as this crowd begins to look at them and people are watching them, uh, some folks maybe thought that Peter and John were, were some new guys in town. And so they had a new power and, and folks wanted a healing ministry to start or some other type of initiative. And Peter makes two things really clear here. The first one is, he says, this man's healing was not a result of our power. Uh, look at what he says. It says it there in verse 12. Why do you wonder or why do you stare at us as though by our own power we have made him walk? Remember, when Peter healed this guy, Peter was very clear. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. The physical healing was a result of Jesus. That's what Peter is saying. And now he's reminding the crowd, look, this guy's not healed because I'm special or because I have a power in and of myself. 
It's a supernatural thing that God has done in Jesus or through Jesus for this man. That's why he's able to walk. That's why he's been restored. But the other thing that Peter makes clear is that this man's healing was not a result of how religious or how good Peter and John were. The, the reason for this man's healing was that God loves him and that God loves people. It's, it's a result of God doing something. God had chosen to make himself known to this man through physical healing, but also through this declaration of who Jesus was. This Jesus Christ. You and I often think of Jesus Christ as like his first name and his last name, but that's really not what's going on. Christ is not necessarily the last name of Jesus. Christ was a title that meant Messiah, King, Chosen One. It was, a, it was a term that for the Jewish people, it identified Jesus as the one that God had promised a long ago. In fact, we'll see that in again in a minute as we look at verses 13 through 16. But what I want you to see is that Peter saw the opportunity to interact with this man, to see him, to know him, to, to bring healing his way because of Jesus. That opportunity for Peter was now going to become a bridge to share the truth about Jesus. And so as you and I think about the opportunities that we've been given to love and to serve people, we have to remember that those opportunities are given to us for the same reason or for similar reasons. It's because God loves people and God wants them to know him. And so you and I love and we serve so that we might, to those people around us, make Jesus known that he would be the famous one, not us. We don't want people necessarily just celebrating that we're good, good people and that, that we've got it together. We want people celebrating that Jesus changes lives from beginning to end. And so you and I have to remember that the best expression of love is not just helping someone with a physical need. But it's also, you hear me? It's also delivering the good news of Jesus. So our opportunities are given to declare our message. We serve so that we might share. We love, and the best way to love is to give the good news. Which brings me to the second thing that we have to keep in mind when it comes to being clear. We must be sure that our message is the gospel. Look at Acts chapter 3 verse 13. Peter says, The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, the God of our fathers, glorified his servant Jesus, whom you delivered over and denied in the presence of Pilate, when he had decided to release him. But you denied the Holy and Righteous One and asked for a murderer to be granted to you. And you killed the author of life, whom God raised from the dead. To this we are witnesses. And his name, by faith in his name, has made this man strong, whom you see and know. And the faith that is through Jesus has given the man this perfect health in the presence of you all. Peter is not beating around the bush now. He is going straight in to sharing the gospel with this crowd who has gathered. They had gathered to see if Peter and John might do some more healings. They had gathered to see what would happen next. But Peter knew the most powerful thing that could happen next was for this group of people to hear the gospel, the good news of Jesus. The miracle had simply been the thing that God had used in the life of Peter and John to set the stage for this opportunity to share. And so Peter is just trusting in that. He's trusting that God is at work. Not just that God was at work and what had happened with the crippled man, but that now, even now in this crowd, in this opportunity, God was at work so the message might be heard. And so remember, for, for Peter and John, the, the audience is Jewish. The, the events of the life of Jesus had happened in and around Jerusalem. And so there's a large crowd there that day who most likely several of them had been around the events of the crucifixion. And if not been around, they at least have heard all of these rumblings and all of these things that have gone on. And so Peter is speaking directly to a group of people who had uh, first or secondhand knowledge of the events that led to the death of Jesus and who now have heard the rumors and the whispers about a, a resurrected Jesus. And so Peter is talking to them about that. So he's very direct about the things that had happened and the way the decisions had been made. And so you, you see him mention men like Pilate. And he talks about how he mentions even not by name, but, but how the crowd that day chose Barabbas 
even though Pilate had said he had found nothing uh, wrong or nothing guilty in the life of Jesus, the crowd chose for Barabbas the murderer to be released to them instead of Jesus. But really what Peter is doing is sharing the gospel. He's reminding them that Jesus was the promised one of God. He was the Christ. He was the Savior who had been sent into the world to rescue God's people from their sin and from the evil in the world. And so Peter is driving things that way. But, but Peter also wants to be clear that this group of folks understands that he's not sharing a message that he heard from someone else. He wants to share with them something that he saw, something that he himself and John had experienced. And so at the end of verse 15, he said, look, to these things we are witnesses. That we saw Jesus live the perfect life. We saw Jesus uh, tried in a, in a, in a, 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 a totally um, irrelevant trial, a trial that was, was decided from the outcome, or from the outset, or the onset uh, there, and, and how Jesus was was uh, betrayed and left behind and how he was murdered uh, by the poor decisions of religious leaders who didn't understand what they were doing. We saw those things, but Peter also says specifically, not only were we witnesses to the crucifixion, but we were also witnesses to the resurrection. That the decisions of the religious leaders and the people that day had resulted in the death of Jesus, but three days later, God would raise him from the dead. So that the world would know and the followers of Jesus would know that God had done exactly what he had foretold by the mouths of his prophets. And, and so Peter is laying out the gospel. This was the, in fact, if you track this message, this message about Jesus and his life, his crucifixion, his resurrection, this is the central point, the central message of every opportunity given to any follower of Jesus in the New Testament. Uh, you can track it from Acts all the way through the letters of Paul and John and James and those guys. When they're given opportunities, specifically in the book of Acts, uh, to serve people and to, uh, to, to do something that shows the love of God to people, it results in the opportunity to share the gospel. Now, that is the message. And, and so you and I need to know that not only was that their message, but that's our message that what we need to be communicating to the world is that Jesus has come. That, that, that life can be made new. Sin can be forgiven. That Jesus has is, is come. And so I, I want you to see a couple of things just real quickly. And when it comes to our message, just a, a reminder here. That, that our message, the gospel, begins with God and what He has done in Christ for us. That's why Peter in verse 13 begins with this identification of God, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, the God of our fathers. The, the Jewish people believed in one God. And so Peter wants to make no mistake, there is one God. He is the God of our fathers. He is the one who in the Old Testament began this plan and created the entire universe, the entire world. God is ultimate. He is the first. He is the one that has always existed. And the gospel begins there with, with God. But we also know from the Old Testament that very quickly, not only does it, does it begin with God, but, but also right behind that, man uh, gets in relationship with God and then rejects God. Man has sinned. And there's nothing that man can do to, to make himself or bring himself back into right relationship with God. There's nothing that we can do to get back to our Creator, back to the one who holds all things. And so God has to act on behalf of his creation, specifically mankind. And how does God act? Well, he sends Jesus. Jesus comes and the life that man had failed to live, the life that you and I failed to live in our relationship and in our attempts to get back to God, Jesus lives perfectly, perfect obedience to God. But Jesus also, as a result of his perfect life, lived among imperfect people as Peter mentions here, he's killed. But that death on the cross is not just a part of a story. That death on the cross was necessary so that men, women, boys, and girls could be forgiven their sin and restored back to God. That was the role of Jesus. Jesus himself said, I have come to seek and to save the lost. In another place, he would say, I've come to give my life as a ransom for many, that men and women might be forgiven, boys and girls might be 
forgiven. And so Jesus comes and he lives the life. He dies the death that we deserve, but he's risen from the dead. He's not just in the ground. He's been raised from the dead so that you and I can know every promise of God has been fulfilled and is being fulfilled through Christ. Everything he promised, the forgiveness, the new life, the day coming when, when life will no longer be full of pain and turmoil and evil, the day coming when everything will be made right and set right, is found in the person and in the resurrection of Jesus. And the gospel is that Christ has done for us what we can't do for ourselves. And so because of Jesus and God's work through him, you and I can be forgiven and made new. That's our message. That is the Christian message. Anything else is just extra. The Christian message boiled down is what God, or begins with God and what he has done in Christ for his people. So our message is the gospel. But then let's get to the end of this. Acts chapter 3 verse 17. The story continues and it says, and Peter continues and says, and now brothers, I know that you acted in ignorance as did also your rulers. But what God foretold by the mouth of all the prophets that his Christ would suffer, he thus fulfilled. Repent therefore and turn again that your sins may be blotted out, that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. Why is our message so important? Why is it such a big deal that those who follow Jesus share that good news with other people? Here's why. Number three, sharing the message is an opportunity for someone else to believe. Sharing the message, the gospel, is an opportunity for someone else to believe. You see, one of the things that we can't forget, and Peter hints at it here when he mentions at the end of verse 19, that if we will repent and turn again, our sins may be blotted out. If our sins aren't forgiven, if our sins aren't blotted out, then Jesus has not paid the penalty for that sin. We will have to pay. Let me me rephrase that. Jesus' death on the cross can and does cover all of our sin. And for those who will put their faith in Jesus, his death on the cross pays and blots out those sins. But if you don't believe in Jesus, you don't trust in Jesus, you don't put your faith in Jesus, then his death has done nothing for your sin debt. And if your sin debt, the things that your sin and the separation it's caused between you and God, if that's not removed, then you will have to give an account for that sin And you will spend eternity separated from the one who made you and who loves you in a very real place called hell. But when the gospel is shared, the opportunity comes for someone who is separated from God to be brought to God. To be rescued from hell, from their sin, and given new life. And so Peter doesn't just stop here when he gets to the end and says, look, Jesus, this is who Jesus was. This is what he did. And you guys ruined it. No, in verse 20, he gives the crowd the opportunity to respond to that message. He's not just trying to give them information so they know how bad they've messed up or how bad their sin is. He wants them to know that although their sin is bad and although they missed the moment when Christ was on the earth, that now they can repent and turn again. Because Peter knew that the gospel is not just something to know about, but it's something that needs to be believed. It needs to be embraced. And so he gives that invitation with, by using those two words. The first word is repent. That, that idea of changing your way of thinking about sin and about your life. Not trying to just do things by your own merit, your own effort, but changing the way you see the world, changing the way you see your own life. That's repentance. We often talk about it as just a change of direction, that you're walking away from God. Repentance is that moment that you turn and begin to go back to God. But it's a, in a more uh, internal way, it's a change of thinking. That's the repent part of this. Is I, I can't see my sin as just the way life is. I have to see my sin for what it is. And I have to think about sin the way God thinks about sin. I have to think about my life the way that God thinks about my life. And that requires a repentance, a change in my way of thinking. So Peter gives that invitation, repent, therefore. Because now you know the truth, because now you've heard the gospel, you can repent from the way that you have lived. And you can choose to live a different way, specifically by turning again. Turning again to what? That's the second phrase. By turning again to Jesus, to God. 
The only way for this group of people and the only way for any person watching this video or for anyone that you'll share the gospel with to return to God is by repenting and turning again to Jesus. Jesus told uh, Thomas in John 14, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man can come to the Father. Nobody gets to God except through me. That's the repent and turn again. But when a person repents and turns again, when a person changes the way they're thinking and turns to Christ, what happens? Well, he says it in verse 19, at the end of verse 19 and verse 20, that your sins may be blotted out. That's the picture of forgiveness. And times of refreshing, that's the picture of renewal, right? New life may come from the presence of the Lord. Th this act of believing is what we call faith. And this faith, this trust in Jesus is what brings about forgiveness and wholeness. So when you and I share the gospel, we have to know that it's an opportunity for someone to repent and turn again, for their sins to be blotted out, and for times of refreshing to come from God. Forgiveness and new life. Our sharing of the gospel can result in their sins being forgiven, can result in their lives being made new. And then you and I get to walk with these new people, these new brothers and sisters, as we follow Jesus together. Our message. Our opportunities are given to us so that we might declare our message. Our message is the gospel. And sharing the message is an opportunity for someone to believe. But as we did last week, let's just keep it simple again today. I want to just ask you as you watch this today, have you believed the gospel? I mean, it's one thing for me to tell you how you ought to share this, but, but have you believed it? Have you repented and turned again? Have you found Jesus to be the forgiver of sins and the one who can give you new life? Today, you can do that if you've never trusted in Christ, you've never put your faith, your trust in Him. Man, everything that's in the gospel is available to you. Jesus lived the life that you can. He died the death that your sin has left you deserving. But he was risen from the dead so that you could know that God can and does forgive your sin. And he does want you as, your, as his child. And today, if you'll confess your sin, just admit to God that you're a sinner. You're a person who's separated from him. You've lived life according to your own rules and not according to his. Confess that. But then trust in Jesus all that Jesus did for you. And then ask Jesus to save you. Man, today you can begin again. And you'll find that your sins have been blotted out and times of refreshing can come. And so if you've never done that right now, you'll find a link in the comment section or over on the chat box. And uh, man, we'd love to connect with you if you've never believed the gospel. You've never professed your faith in Jesus. Man, today's the day. Somebody has prayed for you to have this opportunity. Why not answer that today? Answer the call to come follow Jesus. But for those of us who have believed the gospel, I want to just ask you again what I asked you last week. If you've believed the gospel, then who is one person that you could share it with and invite to respond? Who's your one? Who's your one? Let me pray for you today. Father, thank you for this morning. God, thank you for the gospel. Father, thank you that as our creator, when we sin and when we walk away from you, that God, you have made it possible for Jesus to be our rescuer. Jesus, thank you for coming and living the life that we could not. Thank you for dying the death that our sin had earned. And thank you for rising again that we might know, that we might be witnesses of the change that you've brought in our lives because God has been faithful. And so, Father, I pray today for those watching. God, if there's someone watching who's never put their faith in Jesus, never believed the gospel, God, I pray today would be the day. God, would you help them to click or to call this week? And let's have a conversation. But God, I pray that even today they've prayed and they have asked, would ask Jesus to be their Savior. And God, today you would forever seal them as your son or as your daughter. And then, God, for those of us who are your followers, God, I pray that you have and are bringing one person to mind that we might share with and invest in. That, God, we might have a conversation with that could result in their lives being forever changed by Jesus for your glory. So, God, help us to answer the question, who's your one? And to make the most of opportunities that you give us 
to love and to serve, but also to share the good news of Jesus. God, you're good to us in all your ways. In Jesus' name, amen. You guys have a great week.